Thank you for joining Resurrection Lutheran Church this Sunday morning, giving praise with us for God's blessings of music, prayer, and scripture. I, Pastor Karen Perkins, will be sharing a message of grace, forgiveness, and hope. All of the worship leaders welcome you. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the God of man, the God of miracles, the God of mercy. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you. And also with you. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. O oh God, from you come all holy desires, all good counsels, and all just works. Give to us, your servants, that peace which the world cannot give that our hearts may be set to obey your commandments, and also that we, being defended from the fear of our enemies, may live in peace and quietness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. church. 
is remembering our baptism in that water. Victoria, will you come and pray with me? There's no babies here. Can we pray before we go play? You don't have to say the words, just say the name. Dear God, thank you for this time of growth. Thank you for the rain that helps other things grow as much as we may want to play in the sun. We need that water just like we need our baptisms. Let us remember them as we grow and keep you in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Now we yeah! Good advice. 
It's tough to find some good news here, isn't it? In that reading from Amos, devastation coming for the people of Israel. I mean, devastation. The prophet Amos comes up from Judah and says to the leaders there, you have not been treating the people well. You have not been caring for the poor. You have not been coming together to worship. You've been doing all these other things. And now judgment is coming. And, and the really terrifying thing about this passage, about this story, is this is, this is the story of the northern kingdom of Israel. Right? And, and if you remember the history, what happens is, is the Assyrians, the Assyrian Empire comes in and wipes them out. The ten northern tribes, they get, they get wiped out and dispersed all over the world, the survivors. There's nobody left, pretty much. You know, there's some people that get left in the land, some, some of the poorer people get left in the land, and a bunch of Assyrians come in and intermarry with them. That's how you get Samaritans, if you want a little history lesson. That's how you get Samaritans, and that's why there was such a conflict between Jews and Samaritans. But what happens is, those ten tribes, those ten tribes of Israel, ten of the twelve tribes of Israel, essentially disappear. Maybe, maybe you've heard that phrase, the ten lost tribes of Israel, they're gone. And the thing here is, in this story, in this part of the story, there's not a whole lot of hope. You know, in other places, like in the prophet Isaiah and Jeremiah, when, when they're talking to the people of the southern kingdom, and they're going into exile, and they're suffering the consequences of rejecting God, there's always hope, right? That, that there's always, there will be a redemption. That they will be called out of exile back to the homeland. But here, you don't get that. Those ten tribes disappear. And that's, that is sobering. That is a sobering thought. And yet what I would say to you, my siblings in Christ, is that that is not the end of the story. That is still the middle of the story. That as, as the people, as the Jews reflected on this, as the two surviving tribes reflected on this over the centuries, the rabbi said, you know, God is always faithful. God is always faithful to his people, no matter what. And if it would take for God to scour the whole earth, to gather up the bones of those ten tribes and pull them together for the resurrection, that is what God will do. They are not gone forever. You know, it's easy for us, when we are in hard times, to say this is it, that there's no future. I mean, we see that, we see people in our country now who feel that way, right? Feel like, oh, things are so horrible. There's, there's, no, there's no future. Sometimes we're in our family situations. You know, we're in the middle of, 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 of a divorce or something like that, and we feel like, oh, there's no future. Or in our congregational lives, sometimes we get to places where it's, there's, there's impasse, and we can feel like there's no future. But our God is a God of the past, of the present, and the future. And even in this darkest place in Israel's history, the long view is still there's future, there's hope, there's, there's redemption. And it's the same with this second story in the gospel. Again, good luck finding good news in this one. I mean, this is brutal. I mean, this is brutal. And, and so, and so, at the same time, it's so horribly sad, right? That Herod, you know, it's easy to paint Herod as Herod is just absolutely evil. Evil. It's absolutely evil. But I invite you to look at the story a little more. You know, yeah, he's, he's cunning. He's politically motivated. I mean, that's why he marries his brother's wife, because he's got his politics on, on his mind. He wants to be the next big king. So, yeah. When your brother Herod Philip is a little king over here and you're a little king over here, yeah, take your, take your brother's wife. Maybe he'll get another kingdom. So yeah, he's not a good guy. But it's interesting to me that in the text it tells us that 
Even though John was telling him, Herod, what you're doing is wrong, he still liked to listen to him. Did you pick up on that? He liked to listen to him. He liked to get scolded. Maybe there was a little opening there. Right? Maybe there was a little bit of self-awareness that eh, this isn't quite right. But he was perplexed and he just couldn't, he couldn't, couldn't take it. Although, on a deep level, he recognizes that John is a good and holy man. And so he protects him, even though his wife is really angry and wants John dead. Herod is, no, that would be the wrong thing to do. And, then, and he ends up in this really just uh, mixed up, tragic, crazy situation, right? His stepdaughter comes in and does a dance at the feast and he says, oh, I'll give you anything, even half my kingdom. Somebody had too much wine, right? Somebody had too much wine. Why does he set it in front of everybody? And the girl goes out and says to her mom, what do you want me to do? Because she, 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 had, she's not, she doesn't have any malice, right? She's not, she doesn't have any vendetta or agenda here. She's like, well, mom, you know, tell me what to do. Get the head of John the Baptist on. Get the head of John the Baptist. And see, Here's one of those other little details that just that bothers me. And she goes back and she says, I want the head of John the Baptist on a plate. You know, it makes it a little more extreme, just a little more bizarre, a little more, ugh. I don't know if that's a word, but that's, that's what it makes me feel like. You know? And that's what happens. And you say, well, where's, where's, the, where's the good news in this story? You know, that, that it's, 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 so hard to, it's so hard to see it. You know, the little text, the little intro text there in your bowl and gives us a little hint that even though John the Baptist, the prophet, is killed, Jesus goes on and his message goes on. And interestingly, later on, Herod does run into Jesus. You remember at the end of the Gospel, Herod does run into Jesus and Pilate sends Jesus to Herod because Pilate says, oh, this is a Galilean, so Herod has jurisdiction. Herod should kill him, right? Herod should take care of this for him. Herod should kill this troublemaker because he's from Galilee. And Herod doesn't kill him. Herod won't do it. Is there a tiny glimmer of light there? I don't know. You could, you could be the judge. But what I will say is that that relentless message of the gospel keeps on coming. That even Jesus' death didn't stop it. That he rose again. And the message went out. And others picked up that message. That really, no matter where we are in our lives, together as a country, as a family, as a congregation, as the Alaska Synod, no matter where we are together in our lives, it is always the middle of the story. It's always the middle of the story. God is still at work. Because we have that promise that Paul tells us. That we have redemption through Jesus' blood. We have the forgiveness of our trespasses. So that all that terrible stuff that happens, that there is the possibility of forgiveness. And it's because it's according to the richness of His grace that He lavished on us. Lavished. There's your word to pay. That God lavished grace on us. God just kept on pouring and pouring and pouring grace on us. So that even in the darkest times, we can have hope. And so I invite you to especially pay attention to the words of the hymn that we're about to sing. Because whoever picked the hymn today read the text carefully. Because it is the sermon on more time. So let those words seep into you. That even when we're in that dark place, God's light is always shining. And God's hope is always the gift that we can receive. Thanks be to God. Please join with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father. And he will 
come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. This is the part of our service where we lift up our gifts to God. 
we offer ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Members, of course, are encouraged to give our regular tithes and offerings through an assigned number, and we have regular vehicles for doing that. You're invited to go to our website and use PayPal or one of the other donate buttons that we have on the website. You can make a special offering to the RLC on KINY ministry, which helps keep this on the air, or to the RLC food pantry, or to Juno Live, which helps with community outreach. You're also more than welcome to come by in person or make a food donation. We encourage people also to be involved with the community and appreciate volunteers. All of these things are gathered together in song and Jesus, bread of life, you have set this table with your very self and called us to the feast of plenty. Gather what has been sown among us and strengthen us in this meal. Make us to be what we receive here, your body for the life of the world. Amen. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory. This has been an abridged worship service of Resurrection Lutheran Church. You are welcome to join us for worship in person on Sunday mornings at 930. We are located at 740 West 10th Street in downtown Juneau. Our phone number is 586-2380. More information about our location, parking lot, current COVID policy, and other contact information is available on our website at rlcjuno.org. The website is also the best way to learn about what events are happening with the community outreach ministry, Juno Live. With a vital food pantry, bell choir, quilting group, Bible study, and others, there may be a ministry here just for you. Come and see.